We want to thank God um, for allowing us to come together. We want to welcome you to the Monday Night Bible Study. It's July 27th, 2020. So we thank God for this opportunity. We're going to go to God in prayer. Father, I thank you for this day. <clears throat> it's the day that you've made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. We thank you for who you are. We appreciate you today, oh God. We just want to say that. We want to say thank you for all the things that you've done. Allow us to come to this place and given us a mind to even be in the presence of, of you and of the other saints. And we thank you for the word of God. <clears throat> we thank you for giving us understanding tonight. You set out all thy getting, get an understanding, and wisdom is the principal thing. I thank you, Lord, for speaking to our hearts through your word. I pray that this word will be written on the table of our hearts so we might not sin against you. Thank you for the opportunity to break bread with you tonight and with our brothers and sisters. We thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we want to thank God. Uh, we have been studying about... Disciple Your City, and discovered this is week six, and uh, we are going to talk a little bit more about something we talked about last week. I uh, got a question about the teaching that we were um, talking about last week. There was a little clip sent to me and said, I don't understand by what authority, what, whose authority, what are you talking about? We were talking about how we have authority to speak in Jesus' name, but there was a question about what, what are you saying? And it was really good that the person uh, sent me the clip of the teaching and asked me the question, and uh, <clears throat> I was, had an opportunity to respond to them. But then I got to thinking about it. I said maybe there were others that had the same question. And not only that, it's good, just like the Bereans. They didn't take Paul's word for it. They went home and studied it. For themselves and he said they were more honorable because they looked up the scriptures for themselves and so I thought this week it was just burning in my heart I thought we'll take a little time and we'll talk more about by what authority do you do these things I thought that was a really good question and so we're gonna um, spend some time in that tonight uh, this first article I'm reading was written by a man named Ron Graham and I uh, it was entitled, By What Authority Do You Do These Things? The temple leaders were questioning Jesus. So this isn't the first time. Obviously, there's nothing new under the sun. But Jesus' authority was questioned. And so Jesus drove the merchants out of the temple, and the temple leaders questioned his authority. So we look at their impudence, their hypocrisy, their dishonesty, and observe how Jesus answered them. So we're in Matthew chapter 21, verses 12 through 15, and then 23 through 27. Jesus entered the temple courts and drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. He said to them, it is written, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you're making it a den of thieves. The blind and the lame came to him at the temple, and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the teachers of the law saw the wonderful things he did, and the children shouting in the temple courts, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. Jesus entered the temple courts, and while he was teaching, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him. We're at verse 23 now. By what authority are you doing these things, they asked, and who gave you this authority? Verse 24, Jesus replied, I will also ask you one question. If you answer me, I will tell you by what authority I'm doing these things. John's baptism, where did it come from? Was it from heaven or of human origin? They discussed it among themselves and said, if we say it's from heaven, he will ask why we didn't believe John. But if we say it is of human origin, we fear the people, for they all hold that John was a prophet. Verse 27, so they answered Jesus, we don't know. Jesus replied, then I won't tell you by what authority I'm doing these things. And this wasn't the first time. This was the second time that Jesus had cleansed the temple of its money-grubbing merchants. At the beginning of his ministry, he had done the same thing. 
John chapter 2, verses 14 through 19. We read this a uh, week or two ago. In the temple, Jesus found the sellers of oxen, sheep, and pigeons, and the money changers sitting there. And Jesus made a whip from cords, and he then drove them all out of the temple with their sheep and oxen. And he spilled the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. Verse 16, and he ordered those who sold the pigeons, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of merchants. His disciples remembered that it was, it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. Verse 18, so the Jews said to him, what sign do you show us to prove your right to do these things? And Jesus answered them, destroy this temple, and in three days, I will raise it up. Same question, different answers. On both occasions, the same question was asked. What sign do you show us to prove your right to do these things, and by what authority are you doing these things? Well, the answers Jesus gave were different. In the first case, he gave a cryptic answer that meant he would give them a sign when they killed him, and he would rise from the dead. In the second event, he gave a cunning answer in the form of a question about John the baptizer, which threw them into a dilemma. On the second occasion, the religious leaders should have understood Jesus better. They'd been exposed to Jesus' teaching and miracles, but they hadn't listened and observed in a reasonable manner. Let's look at their question. The question of impudence. Impudent means to be rude or cocky or offensively bold behavior. So the blind and the lame came to him at the temple and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the teachers of the law saw the wonderful things he did and the children shouting in the temple courts, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. If they hadn't seen his miracles, perhaps we could understand their questioning his authority. But they would not acknowledge publicly the inevitable conclusion that one of them, Nicodemus, we talked about that, had earlier confided to Jesus in John chapter 3. Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God. For no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. The question was impudent because Jesus had clearly shown by his signs and wonders that he had great authority from God. However, these religious leaders were jealous. Their own authority was being shown up as not from God. <laughs> then We'll deal with the question's hypocrisy. Those in charge of the temple, the house of God, were allowing its sacred precincts to become a place of money-making. Animals were being sold for sacrifice. Opportunistic merchants and bankers had invaded God's house. Jesus was even moved to call them robbers. If anyone was going to question authority for what went on in the temple, surely these leaders should have questioned themselves. Who gave them authority to turn the temple into a market? Jesus was using the temple as a place for teaching truth and healing the sick. The things he was doing were perfectly scriptural and appropriate on that sacred ground. Yet his authority was questioned by those who were condoning sacrilege in that place. Well, let's deal with the dishonesty of the question that they were asking. Jesus saw through the hypocrisy of these dishonest men. He knew they were rejecting him in the same way they had rejected John the baptizer. So he threw that at them. He would answer their question if they would first answer his. Did John the baptizer have authority from God to baptize for the forgiveness of sins? They could see the trap. By admitting John's authority, they would condemn themselves. By speaking against John, they would anger the populace who believed in both John and Jesus. So they said lamely, we don't know. They could not be honest one way or the other and face the consequences. So Jesus rejected their right to question him. 
the authority of Jesus. After his death and resurrection, which was the sign he spoke about, Jesus said to his disciples, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Matthew 28, 18. That is the answer to the question. God has highly exalted him and given him the name that is above every name, Philippians 2, 9. In that name resides the authority of Christ over all. So, let us not respond to Jesus with impudence, hypocrisy, or dishonesty, but rather with reverence, genuine faith, and truthfulness. So, by what authority do you do these things? That was the question. What are you talking about? What authority? Christian leaders question believers' authority. And it's clear by the book of Acts that the disciples were not confused about the authority they had been given by Jesus Christ. All you have to do is read through the book of Acts. They knew clearly their authority. Last week, we talked about the power and the authority that we as believers have in the name of Jesus. So why am I spending this kind of time on this? Because I was telling the person that sent the question is that, you know, there's articles out there that say we, we're confused. We don't have the authority to use the name of Jesus Christ. And I said, that's why the church is powerless. They can't even pray a headache off of somebody because they don't even understand who they are in Christ. It's really important that we understand who we are. After Jesus rose from the dead, he gave explicit instructions to his followers in Mark 16, 15. And he said unto them, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And that is what this whole study is about, discipling your city, sharing the gospel with others. And that was the instruction that he gave us. Now, the keys of the kingdom in Scripture, one of the most dramatic moments in Jesus' life is recorded in Matthew chapter 16, 13 through 20. After asking his disciples who they thought he was, Peter rightly identifies him as the Christ, the Son of the living God, in verse 16. And then moments later, Jesus says this to Peter, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven, in verse 19. So what are the keys of the kingdom? Let's read down through that. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, Well, some say John the Baptist, and others say Elijah, and still others say Jeremiah. Or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked. What do you say I am? Who do you say I am? That's a question we need to ask right now. Who do you say Jesus is? If you're going to disciple someone else, lead them to the Lord or lead them to a deeper walk with Christ. Do you know who Christ is? Who do you say he is? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. On what rock? The truth that you just spoke, Peter. He was and is the Messiah the son of the living God. We have to know that too. We need to know who Jesus is because this is what he built his church on. The foundation of the church is built on the fact that Jesus is who he said he was. He said, the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give, now he's still talking. I will give you the keys of the, of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will, will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he ordered his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. So the symbolism of the keys of the kingdom. You know what? In, the bo in both the Old and the New Testament, keys symbolize power and authority, and they still do. 
The nature of that power and authority varies depending on the context. In Isaiah 22 and 22, it refers to the key of the house of David, which in the context refers to the authority of the steward who manages the household of the king. Verse 22, I will give him the key to the house of David, the highest position in the royal court. When he opens doors, no one will be able to close them. When he closes doors, no one will be able to open them. That same imagery is applied to the risen Christ in Revelations 3 and 7. He said, write this letter to the angel of the church in Philadelphia. This is the message from the one who is holy and true, the one who has the key of David. What he opens, he's referring right back to that Isaiah 22, 22. What he opens, no one can close. And what he closes, no one can open. Who also has the keys of death and Hades. Revelations 1, 18. Jesus, I am the living one. I died, but look, I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and the grave. In Luke eleven fifty two, 52, he, Jesus talking again, what sorrow awaits you experts in religious law? For you remove the key to knowledge from the people. You don't enter the kingdom yourselves and you prevent others from entering. What's he talking about? Jesus claims that the experts in the Jewish law, they've taken away the key of knowledge. In other words, through their hypocrisy, they have not only failed to enter the kingdom of God themselves, but have prevented others from entering as well. So this reference to the key of knowledge sheds light on the expression keys of the kingdom here. Through Peter's faithful proclamation of the gospel, the door to the kingdom will be open to those who respond in faith, while at the same time keeping shut to those who do not respond in faith, because the gospel determines what is bound and what is loosed. The disciples' actions of binding and loosing here on earth express heaven's verdict itself. I want you to miss that. He has given the authority. What you bind on earth is bound in heaven. What you loose on earth is loosed in heaven. What is he talking about? When you follow the word of God, heaven is backing up your verdict. Look at Luke 10, 16. Then he said to the disciples, anyone who accepts your message is also accepting me. He's talking to the disciples. When you walk in there and you say, I come as an ambassador of Jesus Christ, and they receive your message, he said, they're receiving me. Why? Because I sent you. An ambassador is sent in the name of what? The country or the king or the ruler. And he says, and anyone who rejects you is rejecting me. And anyone who re rejects me is rejecting God who sent me. While the focus in this passage is the disciples, the same authority is extended to the entire church. In Matthew 18, 18, he says, I tell you the truth. Whatever you forbid on earth will be forbidden in heaven, and whatever you permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. So Jesus uses the same language of binding and loosing in the context of how the church should handle church discipline. When the church follows Jesus' teaching, they can be confident that their actions of binding and loosing are actually an extension, an extension of God's actions in heaven. When we do it according to the word of God, we follow the scripture as he's outlined. He's saying, whatever your determination is, all of heaven is backing it. Thus, 
when it comes to the authority and power of the keys of the kingdom, it's not something that rests just in the disciples as individuals or even in the church as an institution. That's because the final authority rests in the gospel itself. Romans 1.16, he said, For God declares that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. When you preach the gospel, you're preaching with the authority and the power as if it was God himself talking because he backs up his word. Galatia makes this point crystal clear in Galatians 1, 6 through 9. Paul stresses that if anyone, even if he or an angel from heaven preaches a gospel other than the one he preached, they are under God's eternal curse. Later in the letter, Paul recounts a time when he publicly rebuked Peter because his conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel. That was in Galatians 2.14. When I saw that they were not following the truth of the gospel message, I said to Peter in front of all the others, I explained to the person that sent the question to me, I felt after reading that and listening to that passage, I felt the weight of rightly dividing the word of truth. There's a way. There is a, and what do I mean by that? The responsibility to teach the word. And he said, we should speak as the oracles of God, as if God himself, and hopefully he is, by his spirit is speaking the word of God. I felt the weight of the responsibility of that, to go back and make sure because it would take an apostle to rebuke an apostle. You know, that's Paul and Peter on the same level. So when Peter was backing up off the gospel because of peer pressure, Paul had to rebuke him. And he rebuked him openly before everyone. Now, why would he do that? Because of the position that Peter held. Because of the authority that he spoke in. It took someone on that same level to rebuke Peter because Peter was wrong. Galatians 2.14, when I saw that they were not following the truth of the gospel message, I said to Peter in front of all the others, since you, a Jew by birth, have discarded the Jewish laws and are living like a Gentile, why are you now trying to make these Gentiles follow the Jewish traditions? Because Peter succumbed to peer pressure. That's why. He knew better. That's why we have to be sold out totally to who we belong to, and that's Jesus. And let you know, Peter, even after all the miracles and preaching and 3,000 souls come to Christ, at any time we're subject, right, to succumb to our human flesh. And that's all that was. But thank God Paul had enough in him to rebuke Peter. And Peter knew he was right, and all the ones that hurt him because of the position that he held to rightly divide the word of truth. So the keys of the kingdom are God's gift to his people. Did you hear that? The keys of the kingdom are God's gift to his people. When we make decisions based on the word of God, then all of heaven is backing our decision. All who faithfully preach and teach the gospel are able to exercise this authority given by Jesus Christ himself. So by what authority do you do these things? How do you in faith and confidence lay your hands on another person and believe that when you speak the name of Jesus, that person is made whole? How do you lay your hands on someone who's dead and believe God that God will raise them from the dead? How do you pray to God and say, God, forgive them for they know not what they do? By what authority do you have to ask for forgiveness for anyone? Do you understand the concept of power of attorney? The authority to act for another person in a specified legal or financial matter. The person authorizing the other to act, they are the principal, the grantor, or the donor. You act on behalf of that person as if it was him himself. You're acting in their stead. That's what a power of attorney is. We as believers have been given authority to use the name of Jesus 
by Jesus himself. John 14, verses 13 and 14. What, this is Jesus talking. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. John 15, 16. He said, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. John 16, verses 23 and 24. In that day, you will ask nothing of me. Jesus still speaking. Truly, truly, I say to you, whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Verse 24. Until now, you have asked nothing in my name. He says, ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. By what authority do we ask? We are asked by the authority of Jesus Christ himself. The name of Jesus through faith in his name. Acts chapter 3, verses 1 through 16. Peter heals a beggar who can't walk. I told you over in Acts, the disciples were not confused about the authority they had been granted by Jesus Christ. One day, Peter and John were going up to the temple. It was 3 o'clock in the afternoon. It was time for prayer. A man, unable to walk, was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful. He had been that way since he was born. Every day, someone put him near the gate. There, he would beg from people going into the temple courtyards. He saw that Peter and John were about to enter, so he asked them for money. Verse 4, Peter looked straight at him, and so did John. Then Peter said, look at us. Verse 6, so the man watched them closely. He expected to get something from them. Peter said, I don't have any silver or gold, but I'll give you what I do have. Peter knew who he was, and he knew what he possessed. He said, I don't have any money, but I got something better than money. <laughs> In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, get up and walk. Then Peter took him by the right hand and helped him up. At once, the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. He went with Peter and John into the temple courtyards. He walked and jumped and praised God. He had been that way from birth. He was happy about his healing. All the people saw him walking and praising God. Guess what? They recognized him as the same man who used to sit and beg at the temple gate called Beautiful. They were filled with wonder. They were amazed at what had happened to him. So Peter speaks to the people at the temple. Verse 11, the man was holding on to Peter and John. All the people were amazed. They came running to them at the place called Solomon's Porch. When Peter saw this, he said, fellow Israelites, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us? It's not as if we've made this man walk by our own power or godliness. The God of our fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob has done this. God has brought glory to Jesus who serves him, but you handed Jesus over to be killed. Pilate had decided to let him go, but you spoke against Jesus when he was in Pilate's court. You spoke against the holy and blameless one. You asked for a murderer to be set free instead. You killed the one who gives life, but God raised him from the dead. We are witnesses of this. This man whom you see and know was made strong because of faith in Jesus' name. Faith in Jesus has healed him completely. You can see it with your own eyes. By what authority do you do these things? As believers, we have been given authority to use the name of Jesus by Jesus himself. But let me warn you, 
There's a difference between believers and non-believers. Acts chapter 19, verses 11 through 17, the sons of Sceva, verse 11. And God was doing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul, so that even handkerchiefs or aprons that had touched his skin were carried away to the sick, and their diseases left them, and the evil spirits came out of them. Did you hear what he just said? They bring handkerchiefs and aprons and just let them touch Paul. And there was so much anointing in there transferred to those pieces of cloth, and people were delivered. God wrought special miracles through Paul. Verse 13, so what happened? Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists undertook to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, I adjure you by the Jesus whom Paul proclaims. I told you earlier, you got to know the one that you're preaching. Know him personally. Verse 14, seven sons of a Jewish high priest named Sceva were doing this. Verse 15, listen at this. But the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, and Paul I recognize, but who are you? And the man in whom was the evil spirit leaped on them, mastered all of them, and overpowered them so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. Verse 17, and this became known to all the residents of Ephesus, both Jews and Greeks, and fear fell upon them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was extolled. The name of Jesus through faith in his name. James chapter 5, verses 14 and 16. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him. Now, why would James say that if you didn't have the authority by the name of Jesus Christ to pray over them? What does he say? Anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. You have been given authority to use his name. Verse 15, guess what? And the prayer of faith will save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And, and, and if he hath committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Listen, don't let this thought be lost on you. The Jews knew. They knew this. Nicodemus gave it away when he came to Jesus. They knew that healing the sick Raising the dead and forgiving sins were only things God could do. They recognized that. So when Jesus came doing those things, they recognized that Jesus was placing himself on the same level as God. This is why they were questioning his authority, accusing him of blasphemy and indignant at his acts that proved he was equal to God. Luke chapter 5, verses 17 through 26, Jesus heals a paralyzed man. Verse 17, one day Jesus was teaching. Some Pharisees and teachers of religious law were sitting nearby. It seemed that these men showed up from every village in all Galilee and Judea, as well as from Jerusalem. And the Lord's healing power was strongly with Jesus. Verse 18, some men came carrying a paralyzed man on a sleeping mat, and they tried to take him inside to Jesus, but they couldn't reach him because of the crowd. So they went up to the roof, took off some tiles, and then they lowered the sick man on his mat down into the crowd right in front of Jesus, seeing their faith. It took some faith. They had to hoist this man up on top of the roof, and the crowd did not discourage them. They loved that man so much, they knew his answer was inside that room. They were not going to be denied. They brought him up on top of the roof, took the tiles off the roof, and then lowered him down right in front of Jesus. Seeing their faith, Jesus said to the man, young man, your sins are forgiven. Wait a minute, he's laying on a mat. He's sick. What's Jesus talking about? But the Pharisees and the teachers of religious law said to themselves, who does he think he is? That's blasphemy. 
Only God can forgive sins. Bingo! <laughs> You're exactly right. Only God can forgive sins. Jesus knew what they were thinking, so he asked them, why do you question this in your hearts? He said, is it easier to say your sins are forgiven or stand up and walk? In other words, either way, it's God. You choose. Your sins are forgiven or stand up and walk. Either way, only God can do that. So I will prove to you that the Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive sins. So Jesus turns to the paralyzed man and says, stand up, pick up your mat, and go home. His disciples were watching. They were watching this. So Jesus instructed them over there in Matthew chapter 10, verses 5 through 8. He said, you heal the sick. You raise the dead. You cleanse those who have leprosy. You drive out the demons. He said, freely you have received, freely give. Back to uh, Luke 5, verse 25. So he said, pick up your mat and go home. And immediately, as everyone watched, the man jumped up, picked up his mat, and went home <laughs> praising God. Everyone was gripped with great wonder and awe, and they praised God, exclaiming, we have seen amazing things today. Matthew chapter 9, verses 1 through 8, Jesus heals the paralyzed man. Jesus climbed into a boat, and he went back across the lake to his own town. Some people brought to him a paralyzed man on a mat. Seeing their faith, Jesus said to the paralyzed man, be encouraged, my child, your sins are forgiven. But some of the teachers of the religious law said to themselves, that's blasphemy. Does he think he's God? Jesus knew what they were thinking. So he asked them, why do you have such evil thoughts in your hearts? Is it easier to say your sins are forgiven or stand up and walk? So I will prove to you that the Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive sins. Jesus turned to the paralyzed man and said, stand up, pick up your mat and go home. The man jumped up and went home. Verse 8, fear swept through the crowd as they saw this happen, and they praised God for giving humans such authority. When Jesus transferred the ability to heal the sick, raise the dead, and forgive sins to us, his followers, the implication is clear. He has allowed us to pray in his name. He has allowed us to pray in his stead. He has allowed us to pray in his name. Guess what? The dead will be raised. The sick will be healed and sins will be forgiven because it's still God doing the work through us. John 14 and 12. This is Jesus talking. He said, I tell you the truth. Anyone who believes in me will do the same works I have done, and even greater works because I'm going to be with my Father. He said, I'm leaving. This power and this authority that has been given to us so that we may clearly show, it was given to us so that we may clearly show who God is in the earth, even as Jesus did. Careful to give all glory and credit to God, just as Jesus did. James 5, 16, he said, confess your faults one to another. Pray one for another that ye may be healed. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. By whose authority do you act? By the authority of the Word of God, because you have been given the authority to use the name of Jesus. 1 John 5 and 16. If you see a fellow believer sinning in a way that does not lead to death, you should pray, and God will give that person life. Did you hear what he just said? Heal the sick, raise the dead, forgive sin. 
If you see a fellow believer sinning in a way that does not lead to death, you should pray. And because you prayed, God will give that person life. Do you see him saying anything about the man repenting at all or asking for repentance himself? No, you saw him sinning, and you asked God to forgive him, and God forgives him. Stephen, they're stoning him. He's getting ready to die. Jesus honors his death by standing at the right hand of the Father. And Stephen says, God, don't lay this sin to their charge. Jesus, he's dying. And he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. So when people sin against us, what is our prayer? God, get them. God, double up on them, what they're doing to me. You see what they're doing, God. Or do we, like Stephen and Jesus, say, God, forgive them. He said, when men, what? Persecute you. They say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. What does he say? He says, pray for them. If you pray, God will forgive. You should pray, and God will give that person life. But there is a sin that leads to death. And I'm not saying you should pray for those who commit it. There is sin that the penalty is death. You can't pray that off of them. It's imperative that we know who we are in Jesus Christ and by what authority we act. In Luke chapter 10, verses 1 through 20, Jesus tells his disciples in verse 16, whoever listens to you listens to me. Whoever rejects you rejects me, but whoever rejects me rejects him who sent me. See, it goes further than just they're actually rejecting God. You know what? The demons recognize the authority that believers have in Jesus' name. We read that over in Acts. They said, Jesus we know, and Paul we know, but we all know who you are. We're still in Luke 10, but the demons recognize the authority that believers have in Jesus' name. Verse 17, the 72 returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. Jesus warned his disciples, and you know what? It would behoove us to take heed as well. Verse 19, he replied, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Verse 19, he said, I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy, nothing will harm you. Verse 20, however, do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in, in heaven. By what authority do we do these things? Luke 10, 19, Jesus said, I have given you authority. So, let us not fail to rejoice that our names are written in heaven. We thank God. By what authority do we do these things? Because we have been given authority to use the name of Jesus Christ. The work is being done by God, but it takes someone who's willing to operate in the power and the authority that we've been given this goes along with discipling our city. We got to know who Jesus is, who we are in Jesus, because we can't transfer that knowledge to someone else if that knowledge is not in us. We need to operate in that. Operate. When you lay your hands on someone, it's not you. You have no authority, but in the name of Jesus, you have authority. His name has been exalted above every name. Every name has to come subject to the name of Jesus. And when you do it the way God says, you're actually extending the verdict of heaven. They're saying, heaven is saying, I'm behind you. That's by what authority we do the things that we do. And we thank God for his word. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you, God, that your word is settled in heaven, O oh God. Lord, I thank you, Father, hallelujah, that you sent your word to heal us and to deliver us from our destructions. God, I thank you that your word will not return void, but it will accomplish the thing that you sent it out to do. Lord, I thank you that your word is powerful. 
I thank you, Father, that not one jot or tittle will change from your word. I thank you, Father, that your word, hallelujah, is what we have uh, settled on. It's what we base our life on. It's what you established the church on. Your word is the power that causes us to leave the kingdom of darkness and enter into the kingdom of light. Your word is powerful, O oh God. I thank you that the name of Jesus has been exalted above every name, and we pray in that name. We thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to share your word tonight. I thank you for the ones that are listening. I pray, O oh God, that if they have not received you as their Savior, that they will do that right now, that they'll just simply say yes to you. I thank you, God, that their lives will never be the same. And those of us that have said yes to you, that we will receive the word that you have spoken to us, O oh God, that we will act, that we will walk, that we will proclaim the word that you have given us, O oh God, that we will be your hands and feet and eyes and mouth in the earth, that people might be set free. You said freely you have received, freely give, that we won't hold back anything that is speaking life to someone else. I thank you for that, God. I thank you for the boldness and the courage to stand and to proclaim what you say. I thank you for that. In Jesus' name, thank you for your word. Amen. God bless you, saints.